Welcome back to Believe in Softball. I'm your host, Jenna Becerra, and I don't know about you, but between opening weekend for D1 Softball, the Super Bowl, and the Winter Olympics, it's been like sports overload in the best way. And the Super Bowl was interesting for me. My dad and most of my family actually are lifelong Rams fans, being from SoCal. Makes sense. And they stayed loyal, too, when they moved to San Luis and when they came back. But my brother is a lifelong Bengals fan. So we have the same dad, different moms. On his mom's side of the family, one of his cousins is actually Anthony Munoz. And so football fans, you guys will know that he's one of the greatest offensive linemen ever. So naturally, he... It's a Bengals fan. So that was an interesting matchup. And for me personally, too, you know, I generally root for the Rams, but I also had a friend from Stanford competing with the Bengals, Michael Thomas, or Mike T, as we called him. So it was just an interesting Sunday. Halftime show was great, in my opinion. Definitely nostalgic for me. Felt like I was in college again, actually. And now I'm glad that college softball now has our full attention. So some quick reminders for the show. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Believe in Softball. That's B-L-E-A-V. And we have video. Believe in Softball is also on YouTube. So subscribe there as well. All right, let's go through today's batting order. First, we will cover our bases, share some news and call outs from around the softball world with you. Then we'll head into today's interview with Lonnie Alameda. And I have been a fan of hers for a long time. I just I love the way that she approaches the game and what she's built. So I'm super pumped for you guys to hear that conversation. And then we will end things with the foul tip of the week, our segment where, as you guys know, we share tips to help us keep going and just help us get better. So let's dive in. Covering our bases. Football might be over for this season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fire coach is going to land. BetOnline is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs. Head over to the website or use your mobile devices to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code BELIEVE to get started. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds. Right to the Olympic coverage is the best in the business. From sports right down to your favorite Vegas casino games, BetOnline is your number one online wagering destination. Bet online, the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports and play your favorite games. Bet online, where the game starts. And where the game started this past weekend for opening weekend for the 2022 season, at least for D1 college softball. As we know, D2, JUCO, all those things started a little bit earlier, but now all of college softball at every level is in full swing. And a few things really stood out to me as I just watched these games, covered these games, just was able to bask in the glory that is college softball season again. Um, First, it was freshmen. There were some great standouts this weekend. If you look at two specific examples that I'll give you, because I could go on and on, but one is Oklahoma's Jordy Ball, 14 strikeouts against UCLA. Freshmen. Like, not only a freshman, the beginning of the season, and doing that against one of the top teams in the country – Pretty impressive, like, period. And then, you know, you look on the offensive side, Washington's Olivia Johnson, who they call Ojo, which I personally love, like, Ojo is awesome. In her first three games, she had six at-bats, six hits, three of which were home runs and a triple. And her first two at-bats were home runs, so just back-to-back jacks to start her collegiate career. Like, just super impressive when you think about what it is to transition into the college level from the high school and travel ball days. It's it's really, really impressive to me when people are able to do it super seamlessly. And these are, like I said, two examples of many. So it is a new season and there are definitely new players for us to pay attention to. The other thing that stood out to me as well was upsets. You know, there were a bunch, honestly, which I which is awesome. Like that's so fun. And one I'll, I'll point out you at UCF actually beat number 12 Georgia. Florida Gulf Coast beat number 10, Texas at the time. Duke beat number five, Oklahoma State. Like, these are just a few examples, and it just keeps it exciting. You know, nobody is safe. And that's that's what makes it super fun to watch, in my opinion. And I, I think these two things, the freshman performance and the upsets, are good reminders for us that age, rankings, all of that stuff, the numbers really, they don't mean anything 
once you step on the field. It's super fun for us to talk about. It gives the context. It's fun for the softball nerds and the just sports nerds in general for us to talk about all of these things. But as a player, as a coach, when you step on the field, that all goes away. Like you, nothing that you do on the field is dictated by that. And we, we saw that really with, with performances like these. And then another thing I mentioned that I'm super excited about for this season, and we saw it already and we're going to continue to see it, is unreal preseason matchups. When you have Oklahoma and UCLA, Alabama and Arizona, and Oklahoma State and Arizona State, just to name a few, in opening weekend alone, that is what we missed last year. Just with all the schedules, working around COVID, the geographic limitations, all that stuff, like this is what we missed out on. And it is so nice to have it back. And we missed the big tournaments too. So we have to look forward to this coming weekend, the St. Pete Clearwater Invitational it was canceled last year. It is back. The, the just lineup of teams is unbelievable. Over half of the top 25 nationally ranked teams will be there just for the context. Like I know I said rankings don't matter, but there is some context there. That's it's unbelievable. And you're, you're looking at, for example, UCLA, Florida State, Washington, Tennessee, Oklahoma State, Texas, Clemson, Michigan, Northwestern, LSU, UCF. Like it is unbelievable. And there are going to be 20 games with two ranked teams competing against each other. And it's unbelievable. Like these matchups include things like you'll look at Florida State and Tennessee on Thursday for opening day. There's eight games, I think, with two ranked teams competing on Friday, seven on Saturday, including Washington, Oklahoma State, and UCLA, Texas, which I'm excited about. And there's four more on Sunday, and UCLA and Florida State close the tournament, and that is going to be awesome. I can't wait to watch that. It's just such a preview for what we're going to see in the Women's College World Series and just in postseason in general. And not only these ranked teams, but the the rest of the teams that are going there are competitive as well. You have like the Wisconsin's, other people from the Power Five, and just competitive mid-major programs that will be there too. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see more upsets or more things that we maybe weren't expecting to see. And it's just going to be really, really fun. And I hope everybody just, just lock in on your TV all weekend. Just make that plan now. And then even after that weekend, the following weekend is Mary Nutter, which is another massive SoCal tournament that we're used to seeing that also is like a postseason preview. And there's seven or more ranked teams that'll be there that weekend too. So we have so much to look forward to just preseason alone, let alone the rest in conference and beyond. So really excited. And I have to say, I have to call out, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I'm telling you, keep your eye on the ACC. They are just on the rise in general. And look at opening weekend alone. Duke did damage at the Kajikawa tournament at ASU. Virginia Tech went undefeated and they ended with a win against number 19, Kentucky. I mean, Richard was dealing. Clemson beat everybody but Texas and Valerie Cagle, their superstar, had a couple home runs and eight RBIs to start things off. Florida State had a couple double digit run rolls. Like, this just barely scratches the surface. For the ACC, but also for the entire collegiate softball landscape. Um, we, we're going to get into it more and more this season, but somebody who is a veteran right in the thick of it all is today's guest. And we had a chance to talk to her right before the season started. So let's head into the interview. She is the Florida State head coach, five-time ACC coach of the year, 2018 national champion with the Seminoles, softball Canada pitching coach at the Tokyo Olympics, and she's coached the USSA Pride Pro team as well. Just what a long intro, Lonnie Alameda. <laughs> Thanks, Jenna. I'm excited to be here. And it's always fun to be talking softball because that means it's right around the corner to start the season. So pretty excited. Right, exactly. That's, that's what I love about this time of year. It's the best. Yeah. And obviously, everybody knows you as the face and the fearless leader of Florida State and seeing you at the World Series and all these things. But I also just know you from stories that I've heard from Stanford alums about your time there as an assistant coach. So like when Lauren Lappin was on the show, she was telling me stories about you and the staff and how she actually credited you with making her a true middle infielder when mm -hmm. she came to Stanford, which was, which was crazy. Cause I did, I just didn't know that before. Yeah. 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 It was awesome. I, I mean, Stanford and, you know, um, an incredible school. I mean, it's an amazing school being surrounded by all the tremendous, um, people, 
not just athletes. I mean, the athletes are just high level athletes, but, um, just the people there of, I, you know, I always talk about success breeds success, but it is tenfold when you look at the six to 10,000 students of just coming from all over the world and, um, so much we get to jump into, but when you're recruiting there, you have to get versatility. Uh, that's a big part. Cause you know, when you come to the admissions and, um, trying to get players in sometimes can be because the application process, you can't just rely on just a shortstop or just a pitcher, just a catcher. You got to figure out like, man, where's our surplus value and be able to get some of these kids that can play other positions. And, um, so many tremendous versatile athletes have come through there and played other positions. I mean, even just Mendoza caught a bit, you know, and then she ends up being in the outfield and, and lap was an incredible talent. So she could play a lot of positions, but, um, uh, and, and that was kind of early in my career too, is I was trying to figure out different ways of teaching and, um, you know, the kids were just so excited about learning the game. So, you know, we'd spend hours out there just working on glove work to throwing on the run. And, um, you know, it was quite fun. So, um, Lauren was a lot of fun to work with and, um, so inspiring because, uh, she would give good feedback. So it was really fun as a young coach to grow. Cause then you're like, um, she was just never intimidated to give feedback. And I think that comes from maybe her dad being her coach for so long. She just had a really good relationship with uh, her pop and like, oh, this works and this doesn't work. And that's how she was with me. And it was quite fun. That's awesome. I Her personality seems that way too. Yeah. Like, yeah. hey, you're giving me feedback. I'm going to give it to you as well. You know, she's yeah. just very, <laughs> yeah. very on top of it. That's, yeah. that's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. And she's I, like in it with you, which is so cool. You know, like sometimes as a coach to player, it's like the player's like, hey, what do you want me to do? And I'm just going to do it. But like, she was in it with you. Like, I'll make me a better player and let's work as being a better coach and let's just work on being better teammates. And, um, that's how I always felt with her. It's just like, let's, let's make today the best we can make. And that's why she's going to be so successful at Arizona. And she's been so successful too. So, yeah. Well, I think that's the cool part about your job too, is you coach mm-hmm. people and you get to see them maybe join the coaching ranks or even just give back to the game in different types of ways, how, whatever path that they choose, but yeah. you were a part of that journey and she was a part of yours. It's a really cool yeah. kind of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. I also love that as somebody who came from a school who has a very particular name for our red color with yeah. Cardinal, I appreciate now too that you are at Florida State and it's like you guys are garnet and gold. So it's like, we can't just call it red, right? It's like red-ish. We both have to be a little bit pretentious, but in a good way that makes us unique. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, You know, it's kind of funny uh, being at Stanford and and going through all that with the Cardinal and the tree, you know, the mascot. And we have that here at Florida State too. And, um, you know, the mascot was more of a student thing. And every year the students would decide and vote on what the tree was going to be. Um, our mascot, I guess you say, you know, it's uh, Osceola Renegade and um, it's somewhat a football. It's not really a mascot, but it's a live mascot. So the mascot can't run around places, you know, and I know um, that was such a special story at Stanford and the band and how unique the band is there. And um, you know, it just brings a sense of family and something different and unique. And I feel that way here with Chief Osceola and Renegade here too. There's, there's a sense of family that's a part of the tradition. Um, it's pretty cool. That is really cool. And I think calling the band at Stanford unique is yeah. putting it mildly. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. I actually remember when I was being recruited, Coach Rittman told my parents like, you know, she's going to be fine. Everything's going to be great. The only time you should be concerned where I might give you a phone call is if she's dating somebody in the band. But yeah, otherwise, right? <laughs> it'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> so true. Those are good, good words spoken right there because they were uh, a league of their own. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, the band has been banned from certain airlines. Yeah, yeah. they are insane. That could be its own, you know, yeah. hour that we talk about that. But <laughs> that should be its own E60, really. Is like, yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> so true. In general. Yeah. <laughs> True. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just an interesting world, interesting part yeah. of college athletics. Yeah. But I also learned from some of my conversations, and I also had Megan King actually on the podcast in the mm-hmm. first season, which was really, really cool just to hear about your guys' journey um, through that yeah. World Series run and everything. But I think her, yeah. Lappin, everyone I've talked to, they call you Kocha. Yeah. Where did yeah. that come from? Um. So... I was at Stanford before John Rittman came in. Uh, I was with um, Sandy Pierce and we were um, 
kind of transitioning into actually scholarship softball team. So we had, when I started there, we had one scholarship and we're competing in the pack and the pack at that time, legendary, the SEC hadn't started yet. So softball was really West coast dominated, but also very pack dominated. And, um, we were the stepchild of the pack for sure with the one scholarship. And I joke, like some of our cheers were like, it's all right. It's okay. We're going to be the boss of you someday. Like it didn't matter that we were winning or losing. Like Stanford was like going to successfully you know, excel in the world. And, um, <laughs> So when Stanford decided like, okay, yeah, we're going to go all in on this and we're going to start increasing scholarships and we're going to get after it. And Sandy decided that, you know, I've taken as far as I want to go. Let's turn it over. So I interimed for the time while they were interviewing for coach. So John Rittman is up at Washington, very successful with Teresa Wilson up there. And um, he comes down, he gets a job and, and decided to keep me. And the very first team meeting, he was like, I've earned the coach title. You're going to call me coach Rittman. And this is Coach Alameda. And for the whole time I've been Lonnie, you know, and now all of a sudden, like, I've, I've gone up, you know, a bit now. I'm like, oh, legit, we're giving scholarships, we're going for it, I'm Coach Alameda. Um, but Coach Rittman, Coach Alameda was just a lot to throw off the the tongue. So I think it was Marcy Crouch, actually, was like, you know, we're just going to call you Coach. And the female version of Coach is a Coach-a. And it ends up being with Coach A. So it just kind of kind of stuck. So it was always coach there. And then when I got the job at UNLV, um, I think five or six girls came down to Vegas that first week and they put notes all around the stadium. So one day I'm at practice and there's a, there's a note in the helmet rack and there's a note in the back rack. We love you, Kocha. We miss you, Kocha. And I think it was Nyberg and um, Dana and a bunch of them came down there. Kier Ching, I think was part of it. And uh, so the UNLV players are like, who, what is this? You know? And then I told them the story. So then they started calling me Kocha and now it's just, it's just stuck ever since. And I love it. You know, it's a very, it's a term of endearment to me because it starts from my very beginnings of coaching. And, uh, and it's also pretty simple and easy, you know, with just an A on the end of coach. Yeah. So yeah, it's a little story with it. That's so fun. And I knew there had to be an origin story with it. And we, we even kind of continued that, that way with coaches at Stanford where it's like coach Alistair, Jessica Alistair is there now. It's like, she's coach Al. I I don't know if it's not normal for me to use her full last name and even, We had Claire uh, Sua, but her married name is Amundsen. And so we called her Coach A, you know, like just simplify it. So that's so cool. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's awesome. And crazy that John Rittman's coaching in the ACC now at Clemson too, you know. So it's kind of full circle that, you know, we were together, started at Stanford. Now we're back on the East Coast and we're together in the same conference and he's doing amazing. Yes. I definitely wanted to ask you about that because what a cool full full circle moment, you know, and I think, in my opinion, I feel like that 2018 year where you guys won it all, it really just up-leveled the ACC in people's eyes. Because like you said, traditionally it was a lot of Pac-12 talk, then the SEC, especially with viewership and everything else, really started to explode. But then here came Florida State, you know, to take it all in 2018. So when you look at, like, the Dukes and the Clemsons of the world, I feel like you guys really set the path to help make that happen. So looking at the ACC landscape, like how do you see that fitting in even with the rest of the softball landscape nationally? Yeah, no, definitely. um, We felt very proud of that. felt like we were holding the ACC flag when we were at the World Series. And I know in 2014, you know, we went, um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I know Vautech had been there and, you know, there's a little bit of this like, oh, ACC, you know, but we were two in barbecue out. No one's talking about us. So 2016, we go back, like, we're going to keep making this conference proud and let people know that you can get here <clears throat> and, you know, made a really good run in 2016 and got some really good experience. And then I remember with Holly Rowe after having that um, interview with her at the end and, you know, just kind of what it means to you. And, you know, it's just, it's so cool that we opened up the the dreams for another conference. And I feel like Michigan probably did that for the North east and washington did that for the northwest like there's a there's a point when you win in a conference or in a region that there's little girls coaches people they're like well we can do it you know so i I think some you know it's impossible you can't win it's an outdoor sport you're in the snow you can't win you're not in this conference like you can't do it then when someone does it then it's like oh no they did you can we can and um so there was definitely that part of 
um, the ACC and I know in 2017, 2018, we were facing some really good pitchers in the ACC. We were putting it together in the ACC. It just wasn't all there and we weren't making the runs and it does take experience. But you look at Vautech, they went toe to toe with UCLA last year. Um, Clemson obviously is, is doing their thing. Duke is doing their thing. Um, UNC's always been there with talent. So, you know, I think what Notre Dame's got going on, it's, it takes getting to that level, then winning at that level, and then having the confidence of the kids that have been there to take you know, kids back. So we've been lucky going 14, 16, and 18. You've got kids that are getting there every year. But now all of a sudden other teams are playing us in our conference, three-game series, last year four-game series. They're measuring up like, oh, Megan King won it? Let me see what I can do against her. So they gain confidence. You know, like uh, it's kind of a – um, an ability to show that, yeah, I can compete at this level and I can get after it. So very proud of that for sure for our conference. Um, but I think also very proud for opening up a whole um, conference of young girls being able to go, man, I, c- I can go to a Boston college. I can go to these places and get an education and compete. And I think for the big picture for our sport, that makes it better uh, for us all. So re- really excited about that. And I honestly think at Stanford when we went, and, um, you know, we beat UOP at home and, and we go and we played LSU, but we played pretty much the whole pack. We were there and UCLA, Cal, all of them. Um, but, you know, it's opening up for the nerds of the world. Like we belong to like, you know, and I'm not putting myself in nerdville because I couldn't go to Stanford. But like I was a part of this group that just um, there was some really hardworking, maybe not so skilled softball players, but we played as a team and we knew how to play as a team and we could take our smarts and elevate our game to be some blue chip kids and get after it. And so when you open that up and be like, wow, I can be a brainiac and play at a high level and I can open this up that all of a sudden gave kids, you know, the ability to like, you know, get after some really good academic schools and know that they compete in the world series too. So it just makes the game better and and makes it more um, inspiring for younger girls to, to get after it. It does. I'm a big believer in, you have to believe you can do it before you can actually do it, if that makes yep. sense. Mm-hmm. And what you're saying is is true. It, and it's also a situation where just because, yes, Florida State won in 2018, but there was so much that went into that for years and yep. years leading up to that point. So, yep. like, it's respecting that process as well. Yeah. 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 And I've seen you talk a lot about team togetherness, community, like emphasis on the unity part, you know, yep. and – and this culture that you've built at everywhere you've been, really. But how do you define that? And why is that important to you? Um, well, you know, I I think a couple things. One is this is our pro league, you know, even though we're trying and we're battling and we're trying to keep softball in the Olympics every four years and we're trying to be able to have a pro professional league and it's going to take us a long time to get there. And that's just the steps of it in any sport. Um But if you're going to get the most out of of what you have, you know, in your college opportunities, um, there's so much you can learn from that. And, you know, now knowing, getting to be around a lot of people in the professional world and even, you know, hearing some of our football players or baseball players that come back, like universities are so special. Amateur sports are so special. Like there's just something very cool about um, everyone's working towards one common goal. And, you know, that doesn't happen a lot in the business world. Like people are in it for themselves or trying to work their way up. But, you know, here you could have um, some, some players maybe that aren't the most athletic, but they're part of their, they're a part of the process and every day they're running and lifting and part of the process. So how do you create that, that family atmosphere, but yet team at the same time, which I, I think is so important. And so, um, you know, I, I choose to, I guess, coach in that, that crossroads of, um, you know, the, the skill sets in the family atmosphere. So can I be transformational? Can I be transactional at the same time? Um, you know, I always talk about like, I am not, I'm paid to win. I know that I'm not going to be kept here at Florida state. If I don't win ball games, I get the, the transactional side of it. But to me, the transformational side if we can have these girls leave in four years and they're ready to take on the world from the lessons that they could get from the game and from the university, then we need to really get after the transformational side and the growth. And um, I think I'm so lucky to have started, you know, I, I was at Barry a little, a couple years and then at, at uh, Stanford and you see the growth of the the people at Stanford and, and the impact they can make on the world. And um, you know, it was, it was pretty cool to just 
to see how much they wanted to make a change. And I think of Amanda Renteria and so many people that wanted to make a global change, which the global change starts in the community too. So I think that if you realize the impact you can make on your community, so many of these players right here, like there's kids around within 20 miles of us that want to be them. And maybe we'll never see other college campuses or maybe we'll have, you know, so the, the part of community is so important. And, and then, you know, it's funny you said that Jenna, but I tie the community into the unity piece because there is unity when you have a tight community, like, you know, it, it's such a, a big thing. So I kind of go down dork road sometimes with all that stuff and really think about it. But if you really break it down and pull the layers back, it is so special. And that's what I try to get them to is like, appreciate today, appreciate the failures, appreciate the successes. Like there's so many cool things you're learning as a person and we're learning as a team um, that you're going to love in 10 to 15 years from now. Like you're gonna be like, wow, I remember that moment or I remember what we did or even last season, the middle of the season, if you were now to have a podcast in the middle of the season last year, I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know where we're going right now. We're struggling, but we had the opportunity to have 30 more games and then we're in the final championship to win a national championship. So like, so cool that we stayed so tight as a group to fight through, fight through, fight through. And so if you don't have family and a community based mindset there, like people peace out and they're on their own and we would never made that run. So um, so I think it hits home for me in that sense that there's a big picture to it, but there's also, you see the successes and how tight a team can be when push comes to shove, you're battling as a unit and it's, it's so much fun to see for them. It was so fun to yeah. watch you guys <laughs> yeah. in the world series last year. It was yeah. awesome. And just, I don't know if scrappy is the right word, but just mm -hmm. always in it. You know what I mean? No matter what, like every pitch, it felt like the team really just appreciated being there, wanted to be there and wanted to put a hundred percent into it. And it was, yeah. it was really, really fun to watch. Yeah. And I love the transformational versus transactional piece that you just mentioned. I love that concept. Actually, when Megan King did come on the show, she was talking about how you really focused on not only her as an athlete and not only her teammates and, and everyone else in the program as athletes, but as people too. And she actually talked about that in terms of like academically her journey and everybody, it's hard as a freshman, right? To balance all those mm -hmm. things. And now here she is, she's a nurse, right? And she's yeah. kind of building her career post softball too. And I just think that that's such an important aspect, especially if when kids are looking for what schools they want to go to, it's like, what is that community like? What are you going to get out of it as a human and what, and what can you give into it as well? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think Jenna, like, and you've realized this too over time, but like when you get comfortable with who you are and you become, there becomes a safe space for you to be who you are and what you want to do and what your journey is, then all of a sudden your athletic softball skills play at a higher level. But if you're always coming in and, and you're kind of timid to, to um, be vulnerable in the moment of talking about what you want to do and, and what you want to be and who you want to hang out with, like all those things as a person, then you're going to be guarded, which means now I'm going to be guarded on the softball field. And so I think that ties in again to, to community is there's a lot of people here. We have a ton of different views and a ton of different opinions and we've been raised differently. But if we can really get past those things and I can get into your dreams and your ambitions and where you want to go and just for a short period of your life, I can help like grow that a little bit by just being comfortable with who you are. I think that's to me like why we get a little bit later into postseason because we, we're just we're okay being vulnerable. We're okay with, um, um, you know, like, um, I don't know, like letting people in, you know, like th this is what I want to do. And that's Megan, man. She was, I want to be a nurse. And then she failed her first bio test. Well, I can't be a nurse. Yeah, I can be a nurse. Here's, here's plan B. Well, here's plan C. I mean, she would come in like, okay, like this is plan. I don't know what do you mean to like S right now. T U V. I don't know. It's like, she went through all of them and we stuck with it, stuck with it, stuck with it. And it, she was so passionate about it. And I know that if I'm around someone that is going to be um, helping me, I want them to have passion, you know, and however they get there, it doesn't matter. But if they have passion and they want to help, and that's Megan, like absolutely passionate about it. So yes, yeah, she came in here a lot, um, but a lot of her teammates were that same way too, you know, trying to figure out that there was a lie. So, so I think that vulnerability piece is, is really big. Yeah. Yeah. But even the fact that she and others of your players felt comfortable, like you're saying that safe space yeah. to do that, because that's not the yeah. case in every program. Not mm -hmm. everyone feels comfortable to go talk to their coaches about their career yeah. aspirations later on, or even non softball things, you know, yeah. so that I think that speaks a lot to it as well. Yeah. 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 And I think it's okay too. like, if I'm straight transactional coach, 
you know, and some people may not have the warm and fuzzy and the kumbaya moments, and that's totally okay. You know, if, if I'm more of a social work mindset kind of coach, that's fine, you know, like, but I know some programs, straight W's, and you're coming in and you hit 20 home runs, and you, but if you're honest from the start, again, a pretty easy place to be in. I think what's hard as coaches sometimes is when they say one thing and do another because they can't follow through or maybe they don't know how they want to get there. Then you're giving off this this kind of um, feel to the student athlete like, oh, you can talk to him. Oh, you can't talk to him or oh, you can't, you know, and like that that's when it creates a little bit of tension or insecurities. And yeah. um, so I think all the time people ask me, you know, in coaching what's important, I'm going to just be you and do what you do because the mm -hmm. kids are going to feel that and that's going to filter down and over time they're going to know that. So if they know what they're getting every single day, that's awesome. And just own it, you know? Yep. Yep. That's yeah. very well said. Yeah. Well, with all this said, I think I could guess maybe one or two of them, but if you had to describe Florida state softball in three words, what would they be? Um, family be one of them. Um, smart. I mean, we have five core values, you know, but I definitely think the family smart play is really, really big for us and committed, you know, so the three of the five, I think, uh, we rock really well. And I think this team this year, family and committed, they have rocked 100% and we're still working on some other pieces, but, um, I do think that, um, this is an all in program and an all in, in team and even alumni, you know, Megan comes back a ton. So I think the committed piece really sticks with it. Yeah. 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 Well, all of those things are necessary to, yeah. to win, <laughs> but also mm -hmm. to enjoy yourself, I would say. Yeah. You know, yeah. to truly be, get that rewarding feeling where you're like, oh, I, I put a lot, all my soul, everything into this. Yeah. And you get, yeah. you get that back when you do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, like earlier you said, like, you know, how, how do you define it? And, um, we define it every day. Like I have to, um, which is another thing I kind of have a lot of conversations with younger coaches about and. You know, you could throw your core values up there, whatever they are, but if you don't define them and you don't actually dig into them and talk about them, like, um, I've never sat down done it with your family, but like when you say the word family, like you guys may have five o'clock Sunday night dinners all the time. And I may never sit down at a dinner table. So my mind goes to TV dinners with my parents on the cell phone all the time where yours is like, it's jazz music and no one's on their phone and they're hanging out. So like right away, we're in two different spots. But if we define it for what your company or organization is, then there's an expectation. So you can take you where you grew up and then we can have expectation of family in, in the softball world. But don't assume that we know what we're talking about the same way we say family because our minds go to different spots because it's just our, our upbringing. Yes. So. Honestly, this almost feels like something that would come up in like a therapy session. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning like, how do you define like couples yeah. therapy? Like, how do you define this? Yeah. Well, I define it this way, you know, yeah. but it's very yeah. true. It's very so true. true. Yeah. Which is why I think family is so important to me because, um, you know, when you say couples therapy or even with coaches, like, you know, we do once a week, we have a, we work with a sports psychologist and, and we have meetings once a week with them because it's so important for me to make sure that we stay healthy and we talk about things and it's a long season. Like it's a, it's a lot, you're putting a lot out there and, um, it is so healthy to talk about those things and dig deep into those things. So I know couples therapy, team therapy. I hear you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Hey, I think it's, I think it's good. It's good stuff yeah. when you can yeah. have those conversations. <laughs> but that's the thing too, is each team is different. So yeah. I, I think to me, what I, I mean, I would love to hear your thoughts, but as a coach and a leader of a program, it's probably an interesting balance in terms of how do you replicate certain things that you always want to be a part of your culture as a program mm -hmm but then also kind of allow that room for each team every year to be their unique selves. Yeah. Yeah. I am. A couple of things I always say at the beginning of the year is to our staff, where you're older, where you're wiser, you know, we always know everything right as we grow, but they're the same age coming in. They're the same age coming in all the time. That's going to be the same. They're going to deal with the same things. Freshmen are going to have a hard time with time management. Like you can't, get to that age where you start rolling your eyes. Like it's the same 18 year old, 19 year old walking in the door. So we have to keep that, that passion for growth and, and understanding in that sense. And, you know, meet them where they're at. Some are a little more mature. Some aren't, that's totally okay that, that we signed up for that. So um, that's one thing. And, and I think the other thing when talking to the team is 
it is Florida State softball and there are core values and there's history and there's tradition, but there's only one Team 39. So like this year, like this is the 39 team that's played. This is the only one. So whatever we do with this, we will not never replicate it. And so Team Florida will have their own and Team 38 have their own journey. So we can take our lessons and we can see where we want to go. But what are we doing right now within the core value system? So we do talk about that a lot. And um, there's a couple exercises that we do. And we have a you know, mantra here about the gate and going through the gate. And, you know, the gate is always Team 39. It's, it's the year. It's the gate. They put their words up there, their values so we, we talk through that. So I think it's really important to, to know that their thumbprint is here and, you know, they are, they are making history um, and who knows what the journey and the history is going to be, but it's very important. So I do, I do think that's quite important because you can live in the shadows of legends and legendary teams and feel very insignificant. Um, or you could, you know, be in the um, goals and where the coaching staff wants to go, people want to go and be insignificant, or we could be so significant to now and what really matters. And that's today and what we're going to do. If you had to give a scouting report, like if you're looking from the outside in at team 39, what would that be? Um, we're fast, we're speedy, we're athletic, we're versatile. Um, we've got some good pitching in the circle, um, so I think that that would be the one thing that if I was scouting against us, you know, be like, okay, there's some things that we need to look out for. But I also think that people will be surprised, um, at least hopefully we'll be surprised <laughs> how much our smarts and our, we're going to grow. Cause we're very young and we're inexperienced too. So to me, we're a different team game one than we are game 30. And, um, I'm always excited about game 30 but it's those 29 games that, that really get us to that next level. So um, we got a month here to spend together to, to kind of knock the dust off and get the, the moving and shaking going as a team. And we actually start that today. So I'm really excited for that. But um, yeah, uh, I think that once we start playing here in, in February, you know, by middle of March, you know, like, uh, you know, we've gotten a lot better, you know, and I, I, just, I just love that part. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I think even like fall ball is always such an important part to the preparation. And then you have that. I, there's so many like different pieces that lead up to that June call it women's college world series that everybody yeah. loves. You know, it's like there's yeah. the fall ball development piece. There's like January, you're prepping for the season, working certain things out early in that yeah. season, like you're talking about and then building it's, it's a whole process. And it's not yeah. just, you know, the, those few weeks in postseason that are so exciting. Yeah, yeah. And actually, speaking of that, I know looking ahead to June and and the end of May, you were vocal about the scheduling with the Women's College World Series last year. I mean, you guys were playing into literally middle of the night into the next day last year and still went as far as you went, which was super impressive. But when you look at the larger picture in terms of what our schedule has been for softball versus maybe what baseball is and and giving – these women kind of the time and space that they need or deserve on this stage. Yeah. What are you looking towards for this year and beyond? Um, I mean, they've made some changes, which is good. Um, you know, it's a lot of people don't know how many committees there are <laughs> to make decisions and changes. And, you know, it, it definitely is the NCAA that will come down and make it, but there's, you know, our coaches association, there's each, conference that has to get together and support it. There's presidents and ADs when money becomes involved. So as much as we're playing till three in the morning and us in Oklahoma state are like, Oh man, that's not fair. Like it just takes so long to get into different boardrooms to people make decisions on, you know, all sports. But I will say this, that, um, you know, I get that there's a corporate sponsorship piece to this and there's money to it. So, you know, I think that we, we want to push and push for this, but we also got to keep taking care of our product to make sure that the product is something that, that is worthy, which we know it is, and we keep putting into it, but we can't get so far out um, in expectations. As I, I feel as if we got to keep matching that. So, um, you know, supply and demand, right? So if we're supplying something that people want, which we are, I do think we are, then we can kind of get to those boardrooms and and start pushing it through. So I think that that's truly important. The other side of it is um, major league baseball is like for, for college baseball. um, 
you know, that World Series is so super long, but like Major League Baseball is kind of the end goal for a lot of these people to get to in, in baseball. And Major League has put all this financial support into studying um, how many pitches pitchers should throw, how many we should do this, I want to take care of them. We can't ruin a pitcher's arm because they're going to make millions when they go off here. So they need six days rest, whatever it might be, right? We don't have that in softball. We don't have Major League softball to turn around and say, like, I'm not going to give a million dollar contract to Kat Sandercock because she pitched 12 innings. You know, a coach isn't going to ruin her. Like we don't know that we can just pitch day in and day out. People feel as if softball can go 12 hours a day. Like that's just been the norm for us. So as we start to get into, um, you know, the, the study of the, the technology pieces, um, the whoop bands for us was a big one. You know, we got to show that our recovery rates were not there. Like we start to get that data and start to show that it is beneficial for rest days, we will have a better product. Softball will be better if we can if we can get um, time in between to even scout. I'll tell you, like you go in that losers bracket, and I was up till two, three every morning, like trying to scout all the teams to give myself a chance to present the next day, um, because you're just you're trying to turn things over so quickly. And so, um, so yes, yeah, so I I know being in it, we want more time. But I also know on the other side of it, we've got to keep taking care of our product to, to want people to give us more time. Um, so it's kind of a, an ebb and flow thing. Yeah. Yeah. To a certain degree, it's like, let's control what we can control yeah. and then make our case from there. Uh, yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting. It just, it's been a, a hot topic across women's sports too, in general, just yeah. with like the basketball tournament last year with the differences, which were somewhat rectified after the fact, but like between yeah. like the setups with the men's versus women's tournaments and things like that. But I, I do think you're right that there are certain things that we can focus on to yeah. build the, it's building blocks, right. Yeah. In the right direction. Yeah. 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 And I also, I'm very mindful and always have been like, um, just because people have it doesn't mean it's, it's good or it's a need. Sometimes there's excess in a lot of areas. And so I think that, you know, like I don't want to look and it's so hard to do, right? Keeping up with Joneses. Like you see what people have and you're like, oh, that's so cool. But like, is it really something you need? Like what is functional and what really affects the team and affects play? And so, um, you know, I think it's a human nature thing to look out and be like, mm, want that. But then when you get it, like, does it make a difference? You know? So, you know, I, I do think there's some things that were special that were taken away. I do think that, you know, when we had the all American banquet, like that was super special. I remember um, we flew out and just Mendoza and, you know, just to get around that atmosphere, it was so cool to be in that atmosphere. I was able to do that with Lacey Waldrop here. And, um, you know, I think those are, are special and they keep a, a community to softball and keep it together. But, you know, I don't know if steak nights and massage days and I don't know, golf outings, like, you know, all the things that they talk about the baseball has, I don't know if that's important or not to us. It's nice, but it's important. So yeah. I think if we can trim the fat and put something together, that's really beneficial to the student athlete experience and recovery and ability to compete at a high level takes care of, of our sport for sure. Actually, I think you just hit on a life lesson to what is the saying? It's like comparison is the thief of joy. Right. Yes. Where, and I think yeah. that's again for life, for when you're on the field actually playing, whatever it is, um, that is, that is something that's very easy to forget. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, I have to say too, like kind of switching gears to the international stage and what you've done with Team Canada, I can see, especially now talking to you more and getting to know mm -hmm. more about how you think of your coaching approach and everything. I'm starting to see where some of this energy that I saw in Team Canada also came from. You know, yeah. like I, I talked to Victoria Hayward after the Olympics and she she was telling me, um, well, first of all, she told me about the if you're mooseless, you're useless uh, situation, which I was like, love that. That's amazing. But also, <laughs> she also told me about how she felt like and, and others on the team, you joining that staff um, for this Tokyo run really elevated the team. Yeah. 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 I mean, I was super lucky. I, I mean, I don't know if you say lucky or not. Uh, you know, it was very trying on a lot of people and, and just the fundamental part of people dying from COVID. So it's really hard to talk about the COVID year in general. But um, the, re the how I got into it is the pitching coach that was there couldn't have another year with Canada and miss his job. 
So then I was able to fill in. So like I got a benefit from a lot of their hard work. They've been putting a lot of hard work. They were challenged with the fact like, oh, my mind was on going to the games and going on to life here in a month. And now I'm going a whole nother year. So um, I think I was able to help a little bit because I was dealing with that with the softball team here too. So my experience right then was able to kind of guide them through that feeling. Um, but then, no, I was just able to jump in and, and help out and build relationships and, and just um, absolutely enjoyed the experience. And, uh, you know, I went from head coach to assistant. So coach Smith had to deal with all the things that I have to deal with here. And I got to be that fun assistant coach again. And, you know, I was the documentarian, like I was taking pictures all the time and putting stuff in videos and doing my bullpens. And so, um, it was, it was a joy, a joy. And I'm so happy to be able to, to see them jump around and medal and, and just, you know, compete, you know, even competing to get into the gold medal game. I mean, we were right there. And, uh, when you talk about, um, you know, the, the excitement of earning something and, um, you know, that, that they really, they could walk away and be like, man, like we gave everything we possibly could to that, to that team and to the game and to the history of Canada. And it was, it was really special. It was. And honestly, the, just that, that fire, I feel like was really evident with the pitching staff in particular, like from Danielle Laurie, right. With her kind of last ride, but even with like Jenna and, and Lauren Regula and like, uh, and all the, the, the whole staff, Sarah Gronawagen, mm-hmm. like there yeah. was such a just competitiveness, like at every single pitch yeah. they were competing yeah. And I, I also get that from Florida State, too. So I just yeah. feel like there's some similarities there. Yeah, yeah, they really, um, they rallied around the the battery. They, they really rallied around it. And um, when I was able to come in and share kind of my thoughts to um, what they could bring, each one of them, um, they were such fans of each other and such fans of like, how can we win this game? How can we do what we need to do? And that makes it so easy to go out and, and get after your skill set because you're like, oh, I'm doing this for, for you. Like, I don't have to be so like, oh, everything relies on me. Everything's on my shoulders, you know? And um, that, that was just so fun. And they all brought something so unique off the field and on the field. And, um, there wasn't one picture that was the same there, which, you know, which is, was awesome other than the pride for Canada for sure. So, um, and I do, I feel like, uh, honestly, Megan King and Jessica Burroughs started that really here together. The one, two punch. Um, I think Monica Perry and Lacey Waldrop had that a bit here. Um, but really escalated into, um, the two headed monster mindset and, um, every junior senior pitcher always stays in the pins with the freshmen and sophomores. Like they always give back. It's like, I'm going to give you everything I have so you can be better. And, um, it's just, it's sometimes, you know, as a coach, you step back and you're like, wow, this is so special and so cool. And definitely felt that with team Canada and the, and that pitching group. It was, it was awesome. Yep. It was, it was awesome to watch. And I also know that you talk a lot about just being in the moment in a general yeah. sense. So with that experience, what were some of your favorite or most impactful moments? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think probably, you know, some of the, the ones I remember most is them on the podium. I I don't know, like, you know, I mean, it's kind of the same thing as, is when that last moment, if you win a game and, you know, at, in 2018, just Megan King and Anna, you know, hugging each other, you know, I saw Danielle Laurie go straight to Jen Salling and rafters right there behind her. And, all the pitchers are running out like that, that moment of elation of like, we did it. Like, it's just so cool. So you always remember that, but the podium is special too. You know, it's funny. I don't know. Many people don't know about Olympics, but you kind of get a tutorial, especially in Japan, but you get a tutorial on how to go out there, how you step up, what you do, how you say things. And, um, to see Canada put the medals on each other because of COVID, you know, they, they were presenting it to each other. Like, just how much they appreciated whatever role you had. I, I, that moment was super special and always be with me. And, um, you know, it's really cool. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely moments in games, you know, when, when you're like, remember, um, I remember Jenna throwing a couple change-ups in a row and we worked a ton on like back-to-back change-ups and change-ups in the dirt. And, and you just get that slight, you, know, you make eye contact as you're coming off field, like, heck yeah, like that's so cool. So uh, a, a lot of those, but yeah. I, you know, I'm so lucky I have so many of them. And if you were in my office and could see there's 
there's pictures and pictures and pictures of years. I even Stanford and UNLV is, you know, back on my wall over here. Like it's just a part of my softball journey and I absolutely love it. I'm so lucky to be a part of it. What's more important than peace of mind? Nothing. And that's what NordVPN is here for, to give you peace of mind while you are online. And with all the threats that you face today on the internet, it is more important than ever to be sure that you have the best VPN you can get. NordVPN is the world's best VPN service, offering the fastest connectivity, most servers, and next-gen encryption to make sure that everything you do online stays secure. Plus, you can use NordVPN on all your computers and devices, no matter the operating system. With NordVPN's unlimited bandwidth, you never have to worry about a slow connection either, and plans start at under $4 a month. So grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash believe, or use the code believe, that's B-L-E-A-V, to get up to 70% off your NordVPN plan, plus one additional month for free. It's also risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. What do you think you've learned about yourself throughout this entire coaching journey that you have? What are the biggest things that stand out? Um, I think, you know, probably some things that I'm, I'm pretty prideful in is I'm very honest. I've always been very honest. And, um, you know, I, I think at first, you know, it's hard to have those tough conversations to, to tell people maybe what they don't want to hear, but what they need to hear. And, but in the end, I've realized that, uh, I think the honesty is driven, um, a good solid, uh, family foundation here. Like you're, you know what you're going to get here, you know? So, um, so I appreciate that about, um, how the program has, you know, run in that capacity. I have, you know, if you're going to give out honesty, you're going to get back honesty. So I do like that piece, you know, that, I'm not running this program. We're doing it together. I may be the head person in charge, but we are all in it together. So um, by having those um, that that safe sp- space to have that comfortable conversation um, when it could be very awkward, you know. So I think honesty is probably something that I've just really um, I'm grateful that I've stuck to it, and and it's just really showed in my years. Um, you sleep better at night. <laughs> you sleep better at night when you can have honest conversations and you can put it out there and wherever the chips fall at the end of the year, you know, you gave your all and you could do the best you could. So yeah, that's probably the the one thing over time that I've really learned and really appreciated. Yeah. You can see the sleep on the whoop band, you know, yeah. whether, whether or not you're doing it right. Yeah. <laughs> do you ever miss pitching? Um, no, I mean, I'm probably one of those people, right? Like I pitched a little bit. I pitched and played. I was back in the dinosaur age where you did it all, you know, and we had the white ball and there was no fences. When I played at OU, we were at the slow pitch park, you know, it was like, it was such a different game, such a different game. And, um, I, you know, I absolutely love the, um, the cat mouse part of the game. So, you know, in pitch calling, you know, it's so fun to teach the players, the pitchers and the, the defenders, you know, what we're trying to do, you know, and when you can control the game and and you have pitchers that, you know, really want to get into brushing people back and rolling double plays and popping people up and striking people out and what you need in certain moments. And you could see them really getting that. It's almost like you're pitching, you know, And, and I just, I really, really love that strategy tactical side of it. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's fun. It's like that game within the game that we all talk about, you know, and, and that's, that's one of the fun, more like cerebral parts of the yeah. game. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do you have any maybe lesser known things about you, about the program or things that maybe the rest of the world doesn't know enough that you want them to know about? Mm, gosh. <laughs> um, I mean, there's probably not a ton. I think, you know, you always get the questions of like, what do you do when you're not around softball? And I'm not, I'm, I'm always around softball. I love softball. Um, I think I'm one of the, um, luckiest people in the world to get paid to do what is a hobby for most, you know, like when you love sport and, you know, you get people that want to be around sport as much as they can. And, um, but they have to go to work (laughs) to be able to go do sport things. And my work is sport things. Uh, I'm just so, I'm so grateful and lucky, but you know, I mean, I would spend holidays in the office. Like, you know, people think I'm crazy. Take a Friday night or Saturday night and go out and do something. Like I would be in the office because I just, I just absolutely love it. I love sport. I love all kinds of sports. You know, I, I just, I'm so grateful that you get 
paid to do that. And, and I think that, you know, I don't know. I just, I hope everyone can find that passion for themselves and, you know, be able to do something that they don't have to be like, man, is it five o'clock? Am I out of here? Like, you know, just the day's over when it's over and it's not like a, a time clock, you know? So just very lucky yeah. for that. Yeah. I think that passion is, I mean, maybe I'm biased, but I do feel like it's a huge part of softball and something that's very special to softball just in the world yeah. of sports. Yeah, I remember, like you said, it's like you choose to do it. My friends used to make fun of me growing up and they'd be like, oh, are you going to be practicing with your dad on Christmas? And I was yeah. like, no, but Christmas Eve, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like the, it's just what you want to yeah. be doing, you know, yeah. and, and that's when you know it's right. If that's not the case, then yeah, maybe it's not the right path. Right. But yeah. Yeah. For those of us yeah. that are still connected to the game, it I don't think it goes away. No, no. And, you know, again, so lucky for it. So maybe at a young age, you feel embarrassed to say those things. But then later in life, you're like, man, it's I still have passion and, and inspire, inspiration, you know, to go do something. That's really cool. And um, so and then so special, too. And I think that's what's great about sports in general, but definitely softball. Like you appreciate those moments with your father, you know, and you always have that. And so there's a line going past it of people pushing for scholarship or the moments of enjoying the growth and then seeing that growth take you as far as you can. And it's a really fine line, I think at times, but um, you know, why not on a holiday spend some time doing something you love with your family members. That's, you know, so very cool. Yeah. 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 It really is for the love of the game. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I, I have enjoyed this a ton. I hope you have too, but, and I would, I would keep going, you know what I mean? But I'm trying to, to respect your time a little bit. So uh, maybe we can just wrap up with a game that I play with everybody who comes on the show. Yep. It's, it's called Safer Out and it's super simple. It's uh, when I told Megan about this, I think she was like a little nervous. I was like, no, don't worry. It's easy. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> um, but basically, I'll just bring something up. And if you like it or you agree with it, you call it safe. Or if you don't, then you'll call it out. Gotcha. And okay. I know why Megan was nervous about it, because she's the <laughs> ultimate competitor. And <laughs> even if we play tug of war here, she would like lose it. So, you know, she's probably like, oh, gosh, it's, the competitive is coming out of me right now. But yeah. OK, love it. Bring it on. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Great. So first one is coordinated cheers in the dugout. Safe or out? Um, out. I was curious, like when you said like at Stanford that they had the cheers of like, it's all right. Yeah. It's okay. We're going to be your boss someday. I was like, okay, well, did you like that or? Yeah, maybe I'll sideline on this one, but um, I don't like cheering, but I do like, I mean, we have some I guess, coordinated cheers, like you hit a double and you throw the spear to the dugout and we plant the spear, you know? So like, I, I think, I think softball has gone to, um, we had to cheer because all you had was your parents in the stands. We didn't have people, in the stands. you had to create energy and the world saw that when COVID hit and now all of a sudden they're playing without fans in the stands. They're like, how do you create energy? Well, we know how to do that. We for right. sure know how to do that. But then can we flip it to like be softball energy and softball chatter? And so that I think when, I always talk about we having softball conversations with energy versus cheering. So mm. I throw the cheering out. So I would say out on the cheering, but all in for the coordinated softball things. You know, we get yeah. someone that gets a single and the dugout's like rocking the yes, yes, yes. So is that coordinated? Yep. But it's about a result. So, yeah. Right. But it's not a sing song. Like the moose and the spear, like these yeah. are, yes, these are yeah. like energy creators for yeah. the team. Yeah. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah. That makes total sense. Okay. That was the first one. Yeah. Um, face protectors for pitchers. Mm -hmm. Safe yeah. or out? Safe. Yeah. 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 That's what I thought. I think yeah. that's becoming more and more popular too. Like just at least compared to when I played, right? But when you played, the, the we didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. There was definitely a stigma of like, man, you're not tough. Like if you're throwing a ball over the plate, you should get hit in the face. Like there was all that, you know, and I still get a few questions from some parents every now and then. I'm like, man, like, who cares? If you can pitch, you can pitch. I don't care if you have to wear shin guards and a chest protector, like whatever you feel comfortable doing, if you can execute it, execute it. And, um, I'll tell you this, like, I don't want to have someone walk away from here and in 20 years they can't open their jaw cause they get hit or they got, you know, half an eye. I know Anna Shellnut, um, she got a foul ball off her eye and you know, it's changed the color of her eye. She had so many surgeries, like, you know, you want to do everything possible to be safe and then compete how you want to compete. So I'm all for whatever you feel comfortable with. We're going to support. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it's like, we don't need to worry about what's cool or what other people think about it. Just yep. whatever works for us. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Yep. Yeah. 
All right. I like it. Um, name image likeness, AKA student athletes getting paid. Safe. Yeah. Route. Yeah. Um, who, this is a tough one. I was kind of out in the beginning, but now that we're living it, uh, I'm okay with it right now, you know, but we'll have to see where it goes down the road. So I may just throw a yellow flag in there right now. Yes. <laughs> Do I need to know more information on it still? Still living it. Um, yeah. So I guess safe right now because our team has rocked it and they're doing amazing. And the one thing that I appreciate about NIL and our team is they've done it as a team thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they've got a few individual, but for the most part, there's some team contracts out there and they're all doing it together. And that keeps the unity piece um, out there. And they've been really good about being open about it. So I could see in the beginning when this was coming on the horizon, I'm like, oh, I could see how it tears apart teams. But for the most part, I've, I've seen it be an okay thing, but we'll see as it goes down the road. This is, this is, you're right, when the values and the team camaraderie and the culture comes into play. And, and I feel like it will just inevitably expose if that's not there for certain teams, yep. you know, but lucky for you, like this is something that was already a part of the, your DNA. So this is yep. something that kind of naturally is, is playing out. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. great. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. It's been awesome. I'll send you the, they did a clip on it or did an interview and I'll send it to you. It's pretty cool. But uh, the team's really been good about, you know, supporting each other on it. So I I think it's pretty awesome. But yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. All right. Well, last one is bat flips. Safer Mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Hmm. Um, I think I'm safe with it. Um, you know, it's funny because Sam Chow came in here the year of the bat flip for her. And um, I was 100% like, "Mm, not going to happen, you know, but I also appreciate that there's some uniqueness to teams. Um, I think in anything you do, like, I'll tell you, like, I can't stand when a catcher flips a ball back in the circle, like straight up in the air. And then the ball bounces to second base, you know, I'm like, yeah, what is that? Especially if you're down by like four or five runs and you struck someone out and you're flipping the ball. Like, I don't understand it, you know, but um, so that goes back to cheering or understanding the game and creating the energy. Uh, and I think we could do better than that in softball in general. So I think if you're bat flipping for an intention to show someone up, completely different. If you're bat flipping and there's a momentum moment, I, I get it. Um, but if we're getting into the point where we're showing people up or we're in people's faces, then I think we lost the integrity of the game or, you know, things like that. So I think it's a feel thing for sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned that about the ball flip because that's kind of a pet peeve of mine in general, yeah. not just catchers, but when people just like toss the ball and it's nowhere near the circle, you know, I've noticed that coach Al actually will grab the ball every time and just hand it to her pitcher, no matter where it is. She just walks over there and gets it. But that is like a weird thing. And I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny because, um, Travis Wilson played men's fast pitch and I, when he was playing, I went out to watch as much as I could. And, um, in men's fast pitch, the, they just hand it to the other coach. So the other coach is walking across and they just hand it to him and he hands it to his pitcher. And I'm like, wow, what a, like a, classy move for respect for the game and yeah. you know we throw it to first or third and the that person is a running cross just drops it on the rubber so like try to I mean you know again like we have to have each other you have to have your opponent respect your opponent like you know and so I don't know if people think about it what they're doing or they just watch people do it but if we could think about how we respect our intentions in the game it respects the game in general which you know is what we want to do so yeah interesting That's huh? Yes. And that's one of the best parts about softball is that we have that. So let's hold on to it, you know, at all costs. Let's let's do that. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. Well, this has been awesome. Like, thank you again, coach. (laughs) I've I've actually been meaning to ask you on the show for a long time and I'm so glad that we were able to do it. This was super fun and I can't wait to watch you guys in 2022. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. And remember to watch first and then 30th game will be different. Promise. It'll be better. Yes. Don't worry. I'll be watching the whole time, all the way through. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, so good chatting with you too. I heard tons about you and uh, your amazing success and just you know, energy. And uh, it is really good to see you and uh, do this. So thank you for having me on. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Right back at you. <laughs> this was a really fun one. It was one of those conversations where you walk away just feeling good. You know that feeling? It's just like the best people are the ones where you leave them after hanging out with them and you feel better or more uplifted than you did before you talked to them. That's Kocha. So with that, let's transition to the Foul Tip of the Week. This week's Foul Tip is about community. 
And I love that Coach Alameda puts an emphasis on this, especially the unity part. Something that she mentioned really briefly early on in our conversation definitely resonated with me. And it was the connection calls that she's trying to make this year. She talked about calling Tori Nyberg at Stanford just to reconnect and see how she is and maintain that relationship. And I think calling people to catch up and check in and doing things like that is just so important. And it might even resonate with me because I'm not particularly good at it. I actually, I kind of tend to put my head down and just be a little bit tunnel vision. Plus I'm introverted on top of it. So I'm not just making phone calls left and right. But one of the, the greatest lessons that I've learned in life, but also in my career, is that relationships matter. And I think I've mentioned this before on the show, but when I worked at LinkedIn, fresh out of college, it was my first full-time job. It was one of the company values that they stressed a lot with us. And it just sticks. It's one of those things. It just sticks. And we can take a page out of Lonnie Alameda's book and I think reach out to someone to nurture your connection with them. Call someone you care about and that you value, but maybe you haven't caught up with them in a while. It's one of those things that you actually never regret doing after you do it. You're always glad when you do something like that. So let's just do it. You know, Nike style, just do it. (laughs) That's it. Community. That's the foul tip of the week. You've been listening to Believe in Softball, part of the Believe Podcast Network family and presented by Bet Online. The show is available anywhere you get your podcasts, wherever you listen, including Believe.com. And you can watch the videos on YouTube. So subscribe, rate, Write a review, share, and let us know what you want us to cover. I'd love to incorporate your feedback just to make us even better. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Believe in Softball. Again, B-L-E-A-V. You can always reach out to me on Twitter at JennaBecerra01 and Instagram at JennaBecerra as well. Thank you for tuning in and catch you soon.